First of all, um, any fathers here today? I know, we, I know there are. I'd just like to pray for you before we start. Dearest Lord, I thank you for every father, God. I pray that some of my words might make a difference and encourage them, to bless them, or, to, or the, for the families and the wives, uh, you know, to, to, that they would be blessed you know, knowing that your hand is upon fathers and that you have a, a high calling for them. And I thank you for them, Lord. I ask you to bless them, Lord, and give them knowledge about you, Lord God, as you are the perfect father, you're the good father, and, uh, and so that they can even aspire to be like you. And I hope some of the things that I, can, that I say today, Lord, will encourage them you know, to do that. And uh, I just pray that you would use me in Jesus' name. Amen. Anyway, so as I was researching, uh, uh, I was thinking about Father's Day. So what I do first normally is I write down everything that's inside me. And I say, okay, well, I got all this. This is all good. I can preach that. We're good. But what happens is when you, when you go to speak for people, in front of people, not speak for people, but speak in front of people, um, Sometimes, you know, you have a different crowd than you thought you might, ha you might be expecting. You know, you might have a teenage crowd, and you go, uh-oh, you know, I'm speaking on old TV shows and how they relate to God, you know, and so uh, they, wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't get that. Um, and so anyway, so when I was looking on the Internet, I found this, this, uh, um, this message by T.D. Jakes about Father's Day, and uh, it's called, it says, uh, the one the protector, could you put that up there, Kat? He said, this is, fathers, what you need to be, you need to be a protector, you need to be a provider, you need to be, need, need, <laughs> need to be a promoter, you need to be a priest, you need to be a prophet. And I thought, gosh, isn't he putting kind of a heavy weight on everybody there? You know, I mean, I felt guilty just watching the introduction. <laughs> you know, I said, <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, so as a father, let me go over these again here. And I'm thinking, would I want to present that, you know, to the church? But there's some people... That's what, they, that's what they love. They want to hear what they need to be <clears throat> from the word of God. And so God bless them, you know. But, you know, I personally, you know, like I said, I, I feel, I, I feel getting, like I'm getting smaller already. You know, you've got to be the protector, you know. What about your family? Are you the protector? Are you the provider? Are you, and I'm going, oh, God. <laughs> there you go. And uh, so anyway, so if it starts getting boring at all, I'll come in, I'll start saying, you need to be the protector. Then you'll know where I'm going, okay? So I'll preach, preach his message. But anyway, so um, I want to tell you a story about my neighbor. And of course, he doesn't know I'm speaking about him right now, unless his ears are burning. But he's, uh, um, he's 84 years old. And, uh, um, and uh, he and his wife, they've been, we've been neighbors for 25 years. And... Uh, um, Oh, by the way, my lovely wife, Ruth, and uh, my, my two sons, uh, Richard and Michael, uh, in case you don't know, they're, uh, we're all a big team here. Anyway, so he's their neighbor also. Anyways, I'm not going to say his name, but uh, anyways, uh, uh, I was talking to him about my uh, growing up. Yeah, when I, as I grew up, I grew up without a dad, and my, uh, um, my mother you know, was a uh, commandant, you know, to raise five kids. You know, she did the best she could, but uh, the word love was never mentioned my whole childhood. Okay, so, um, so uh, when, I got, when I was, uh, um, I think I, I was in my early 20s, and I had moved to Houston, and what happened was um, uh, uh, a roommate of mine said, uh, there's a, somebody came to the door and said it was your father. I said, I said, my father? You know, I hadn't seen him in, you know, I don't know how many years. You know, and, uh, and, and I said, well, what do you look like? He said he was about this tall and wore glasses. And this. I said, it sounds like my dad. You know, and so they left a phone number, so I got back in touch with my dad, and I hadn't seen him in a real long time. Of course, I was a, you know, I, in my 20s, I was a, um, I was a mess, you know. I was a... Um, I was a guitar player in a rock band, you know, and I uh, did things like that. And uh, I was just living after the world. I didn't know anything. I didn't really know God or I, I, I was a mess. Okay. So anyways, 
So uh, I was telling my neighbor about this, and he said, he said to me, and at this point he was 82 years old, he said, well, at least you knew your dad, because I got to know him later, you know. And we ended up having a great relationship. He said, and so this is a man that's 82, and he was still grieving because he never knew his dad. Now, so, but the, see, what happens is that hit me. I said, wait a minute. This guy's 82. He, I mean, he's lived most of his life, and he's never knew his dad, and it still bothers him. You know, what does that say about fathers and, what, and the relationship of the father and the son? And, uh, and so then he told me that... Um, uh, he, he said he, his father didn't contact him or even try to communicate with him. He said he searched him out. Uh, this is the, the, my neighbor as a, as a son, like in his um, 30s or 40s or whatever. And he searched him out, you know, and he found out his last known address. So he went there and, um, and, and he, asked, he said, uh, uh, do you know this, my dad, you know, my father? He said, he said, oh, yeah, he lived here long ago. He said, but I think he died about a year ago. You know, so there was, so then there, then there's no hope. You know, I mean, you, you can't, there's no reconciliation. There's no, you know, and, you know, you just think about it. A father has a, a part. He's got, he's integrated. He has a part of, of every one of his children's life, whether they know him or not. See, he, this guy decided he would not even know his father and, or not even know his children, and he's still affecting them. So that's just, I just wanted you to think about that. Okay. So why, okay, why does someone feel a need to know their father? Could you put up the definition for to know? This is to know your father. Be aware through observation, inquiry, or information. You know, so you, you get to see him. You, know, you get to ask about him. You, know, you get to find out stuff. You know, <laughs> I found out uh, after I got together with my dad, he said... Uh, um, yeah, he said, uh, you know, I was a boxer in the army. I said, no kidding, Dad. You know, and he said, uh, I said, what kind of, I said, what, I said, were you a heavyweight? Because he's kind of a big guy, he's 6'3", he's a big guy. And uh, he goes, yeah, I, I box heavyweight. And he said, I said, how many fights did you win? I mean, how many fights did you fight? He said, 60. I said, how many did you win? He goes, 60. You know, and so uh, it was information I got about my dad, and I've remembered that ever since. I remember that smile on his face when he finally got to tell his son that he uh, uh, won 60 bouts, which is another story I could tell you. That's a great story. But anyways, number two here, having developed a relationship with someone through meeting and spending time with them to be familiar or friendly with. See, so uh, that's the title of my message here is to know the father because really that's where it, life begins is when you know your father you know it's where your home life begins it's where your relationship with just really every part of your, every uh, part of your life every different era in your life okay uh, perhaps it's uh, because a man or a woman you know need to know by example, where they're going, what, how they're going to turn out, you know, what they're supposed to do. You know, and they, with, a, with a father, they see you know, somebody, they experience him, they get to know him, they get to know information, and they, they go, yeah, you know, my dad did that, I can do that too. Or they say, you know, or they might say, you know, no, my dad was some great you know, um, person that did all this, you know, what can I aspire to? So you know, it's a two-edged thing. You know, you, to knowing somebody is to be familiar with them, and then you, you get the blessing from it. You get the, the enjoyment. I was watching a, uh, um, a, uh, a, a, a YouTube video. No, it wasn't YouTube. It was a, uh, it's one on a video, Prime Video or whatever. It was about this uh, young guy whose dad was the producer for um, all that German music that came out in the 80s, uh, Kraftwerk, and all, you know, they had that beat, boop, 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 you know, and they'd be singing. The, it's kind of like before punk rock. And, and this guy made all these albums. He made that one, you know, sweet dreams are made of these. You know, he made all these big songs that were big in the world. And but what happens is there's this guy, and he's going around, and he's talking to these people that worked with his dad because even though the guy had his studio in his house, he didn't really know his dad. His dad didn't really care about him. 
So, he, so this whole movie, this whole video, uh, hour and a half uh, movie or whatever, is this guy going around trying to find out about his father. You know, and this is just, I was just, just watching this the other day. I thought, man, I said, there's a guy, he lived at home with him. You know, his mom took care of him, but the father was working in the studio, which was at their house, and they had all these famous stars coming by, and they were recording all these big hits and stuff like that. But the father wanted to do his own thing. You know, he wanted, he was, and, and, and he died at an early age. You know, I think, well, when the, when the guy was uh, um, uh, 30, you know, the guy who, who, the son was 30 is when his dad died. And so, yeah, um, you know, he, I guess he, maybe he was hoping he might connect with him at some point, but he didn't because his dad died. So he made this movie to try to um, find out about his dad. But, you know, there's still an emptiness. You know, there's still a space. Where, when the father's not there, when the, he doesn't know his father, you know, uh, there's an emptiness. And uh, uh, so that's all I'm saying is dads, you know, and uh, spouses, you know, when you talk to your husband, you got to let him know that he's important, you know, and that it's not just uh, if he's a success or not, and it's not how much money he brings home, and it's not uh, um, uh, how much he weighs, you know, it's, 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 you know, if he's not a spokesmodel or whatever, um, that's all right, you know, because he's got a, a more important job. He's got a higher calling. Okay, um, so I'll keep going here. So I'm, st I'm still, like, throwing stuff in the air here. I'm just, I'm seeing where I'm going to go here. Um, uh, okay, how is a person to, to prioritize things in their life, you know, um, uh, and, and so that they can trust, you know, that they're doing the right thing and trust their inst instincts, you know, to, uh, without some kind of a model. That's what dads are. They're a model. And the moms are too. But for guys, the dad's the model, you know, and the mom's a model as for the son. The mom's a model for the kind of woman he wants to marry, you know, and for the, for, for the, uh, um, for, for the girl, for the, you know, the girl, the daughter, thank you. It, um, the father's going to be the kind of guy that she wants to marry. So, I mean, there's all sorts of this interacting, all this connection. And uh, um, so, fathers, you know, your job is very important. And uh, um, you need to be a provider. <laughs> okay. So, anyways, um, so let me just explain a little bit more as I go. And I'm going to try not to talk long, but who knows? Um, when I was growing up, I had three, three best friends, and they had three different types of dads. One was, worked for the city, um, you know, fixing roads and things like that, and his dad was an alcoholic. And he, another one was, uh, uh, had a successful car dealership, and, uh, and his whole family worked at the car dealership. And the third one was uh, um, his father had a management position in our local factory, which was Remington Guns in upstate New York. Anyways, uh, so I had these guys for friends, so I would go over to their house because I didn't have a dad. You know, I didn't, and I liked, you know, being, seeing a father figure. You know, I liked, I liked you know, the, his comments in there that, that were different than the mother's comments. You know, everybody added something to the soup there. And uh, um, so as I was, you know, looking at these guys, I would end up, you know, staying over their houses, you know, and because and, I liked being around the family. And... Uh, um, I'm not, I'm not complaining about what I had, you know, because I, I didn't have much, but so this is great, you know. It's, uh, um, and they'd go on, go on little trips or something like that, and they'd take me or, or want to go to a restaurant. Hey, Parky, you want to go with us? I go, sure, <laughs> you know. And so we'd be sitting at the table, and, they, and the dad would talk to me like I was her friend, you know. And, I, and they, so I had, a, had this model in my mind, this kind of imagination in my mind what, uh, what a father is supposed to be like. And, uh, um, but uh, after, um, after I was kicked out of the house at, uh, at 19, uh, I didn't have much contact with other uh, non-dysfunctional families. You know, most of the families I was in contact with were all dysfunctional for various reasons. Yeah, probably because I was dysfunctional. <laughs> we were all attracted together, I don't know. Anyways, so, uh, so for about... Uh, um, 19 to 31, uh, for 12 years, I was a mess. I was just a mess. But I did connect back with my dad. So, um, 
<laughs> I remember the first time you saw me in such a long time. This is, you know, you know, pardon, I hope you don't mind me saying this. He, he looked at me and said, son, you look like hell. <laughs> you know, and, and I said, oh, thanks, Dad. You look great, too. You know, I, you know, I, was, I was trying to be my, be a, stand on my own two feet, you know, so that it didn't bother me that my dad just said that to me. But um, so anyways, all during that time, uh, you know, I was on drugs. You know, I was... Uh, I was selling drugs, I was taking drugs, I was an alcoholic, I was, uh, you know, uh, you name it, I was doing it, you know, for 12 years. You know, what a, what a, what a slice of your life that is to waste, huh? You know, and so, uh, so I got saved, hallelujah! I accepted Jesus as my Lord when I was, uh, when I was, uh, uh, Right before I became, uh, I turned 31, so that's pretty late, and uh, um, so I uh, I ended up. Uh, uh, God put me at Lakewood Church, which was great, which is where I met my lovely wife. She was playing the piano. And I thought, what a vision of loveliness, <laughs> playing that piano up there. I need to be in the band. <laughs> I could t- I could I could tell you, <laughs> I've got a whole dialogue on. on how we met and stuff like that, but, uh, <laughs> well, so, uh, so anyways, I'm, I'm, I'm holding back from, from going into my, uh, my part. Anyways, there, there, but at Lakewood Church, I, um, John Osteen was our pastor, and I have to say, uh, uh, there are two men. There was, um, at Lakewood Church that I met, uh, my, that became my role models. One was John, Pastor John Osteen, and the other one was a minister named Jim Scalise. Okay, uh, and since uh, Pastor Osteen had all his children working at the church, you know, you got to know all of them. You know, Ruth was uh, Joel's, uh, Joel Osteen's secretary for 16 years or 18 years or whatever that was. And uh, we knew all the Osteens. And uh, let me say that it was the, one of the greatest families yeah, um, and Pastor Osteen was one of the greatest men I've ever known. And so we were there for 16 years. I mean, he talked to me. He didn't come down and tell me what, he, you know, what to do. He said, Tim, you're going to do this. Yeah. He, he'd come down and say, he'd say, well, what are you doing? You know, I'd say, well, I'm building this or I'm doing this or that. You know, I'm working on this. And, and, he, and he'd talk to me. You know, I, and then he'd, um, he'd say, well, this is what we need. You know, and so he never said, Tim, you're going to do this, and, and you've got to get it done by this. He, see, he, you know, he talked to me like a human being. So anyway, so, uh, and I saw that he was talking to me the same way he talks to his son, or, or he talks to his daughter, or he talks to his son-in-law, or he talked to um, the, uh, the staff people, or he talked to the other ministers. He was talking to me the exact same way. I thought, hey, there's something here. I said, and, and later I found out, he was being a father. See, you know, a father doesn't always tell their kids what they need to do. Sometimes he, you know, at a certain age he does, but later on he'll say, so what are you doing? You know, say, and, uh, or they'll say, this is, what, this is what we need, you know, this is what I'd like to do. And then he leaves it up to me you know, to, to try to add to, add to it. You know, so I, I'd say, well, if you want me to do that, okay, I'll do it. No, I'd say, well, can we do something? And I tried, and I would imagine bigger, you know. And he'd say, yeah, because he knew how to be a father. Anyways, um, uh, and <clears throat> so what sets a man apart as a father? Uh, and so rather than starting with uh, <laughs> being a protector, no, um, but what sets a man apart as a father, I just got one thing, okay? So if you take anything home with the, uh, from this, this is the one thing a father needs to be, and it's, got something there? Integrity. Okay, it's being honest. You know, with your children, it's being the same. You know, you don't live one way and, you know, one place, and then you live another way at another place. You know, Ruth and I were at, uh, <laughs> I, I just remember how these things happen as I'm speaking here. We were at Papacitos and we were eating in, uh, um, and we, so we were just hanging out. This is before we had the boys. And, uh, um, and so uh, later uh, the waitress came and he said, this man over here is, uh, um, 
it wants to pay her bill. And, uh, and I said, oh, great. You know, I'm thinking, who is it? You know, and they, and, and I, didn't, I didn't really know who the person was, but they knew us from church. And he was watching me the whole time. He was watching both the both of us. He wanted to see if I started getting, you know, put on an attitude or getting snappy with my wife or anything like that. But we were just laughing and having a good time, you know, enjoying, enjoying the meal together. But the, here's the thing, you know, somebody's always watching you, yeah. you know, and one of them, of course, is your father. And you've got to know that, uh, that if, you, if you act non, how should I say, non-honestly, uh, unhonestly, <laughs> inhonestly, <laughs> dishonestly, thank you. If you act dishonestly, you've got to know God is watching. You know, you've got to live knowing that he is paying attention to what you're saying and what you're doing. And not only that, uh, um, you know, when you have children, the same thing. You know, I, I just, hopefully, I mean, the, the only time I've said anything that was not the truth, you know, is sometimes like we'd, we'd be uh, watching Star Wars or something like that, and I'd say, man, I know driving one of those x fighters is is tough, you know, and then they look at me, I say, well, I did it for a while, I was on the squadron, you know, and then they just <laughs> shake their head and go back to the movie, but I mean, so, of course, <laughs> I do, the, you know, the same thing, you know, like we'd watch the, the alligator fighter or whatever it was, you know, I say, man, I know what it's like, you know, and they just, now, now they just, they just don't even acknowledge that I said anything, but anyways, okay, so, um, so being a man of your word, uh, um, John 17, 17 says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And as a father, let me say that. You know, um, fathers, is your word truth? You know, as far as I, as long as I live, I want every single word that I say to be truth, you know, as far as to my children. Uh, in 1 Kings, uh, the woman uh, said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God and the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. See, that's what people need to know as a father is that, that they can count on what you're saying. Uh, the, uh, John 1, 14 says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. See, uh, if you get anything, just if when you have the the temptation to tell a lie for whatever reason. You know, sometimes say, well, you know, I don't want to have to deal with this, uh, you know, with, you know, my wife, my wife wants to know where I've been or something like that. Don't lie. You're wasting your time. If your kids say, Dad, what about this? You don't lie, please. It's, life is way easier when you just tell the truth all the time. And it's not, it's not a temptation. You know, you, you can try to justify it to yourself, but, you know, as I said, you know, uh, Jesus said, sanctify them by, your, by the truth. Your word is truth. So uh, of all the things as a father, make sure that your words are truth. So now I'm going to close. No, I'm not. Uh, so anyways, um, oh, I'm, and the or interest of uh, uh, diversity, you know, we all want to be diverse here. I just wanted to uh, hang on one second here. Um, uh, I just wanted to uh, say uh, happy, besides Father's Day, happy uh, selfie day. Today is happy selfie day, or just selfie day, national selfie day, and it's go skateboarding day. So if, you, if, you, if you're not a father, you don't really care about this message, I want to at least wish you National Daylight Appreciation Day. Happy National Daylight Appreciation Day. And, uh, um, oh, National Day of the Gong. <laughs> today, today is National Day of the Gong. Okay, and, uh, oh, National Peaches and Cream Day. National Turkey Lovers Day, and finally, National Arizona Day. So, so uh, that's what your government spent time doing is declaring these days National Turkey Lovers Day. Okay, uh, in case you didn't know, you know uh, Father's Day hasn't always been 
uh, a national holiday. Does anybody know when it became a national holiday? Or if Dr. Tim, I'm sure he knows, but uh, actually, strangely enough, it didn't become a holiday until 1972. You know, what happened is, uh, back in 28, Woodrow Wilson uh, gave, uh, declared a national uh, Mother's Day. And it was Mother's Day for 58 years, and then they finally gave, up, gave fathers a Father's Day. So it's not, it's not all that new. Um, uh, as you see, like what I'm doing, I'm juggling right now. I'm, trying, I'm, I'm seeing where I want to go. And uh, um, I think it's time for a video. Okay? Um, and so this, strangely enough, if you look on YouTube, uh, the, uh, um, and you look up great dads, you'll see a zillion videos of one thing, and that's dads saving their kids from bashing their heads in. Okay? So anyway, so, so we're going we're gonna to watch this just for a second. Turn up the audio, please. Whoa! Whoa, that was close. <laughs> <laughs> Dad's awesome. Watch this one. The reason why I show that, of course, is um, you never know. I like that those kids will never know, you know later on that their dad saved them from probably bashing their head. Um, and uh, how many times has God done that for us? You know, I remember uh, one time uh, uh, Ruth and I had just pulled in from eating, uh, having lunch, and, uh, and, and somebody came up and said, boy, you guys are lucky. I said, what are you talking about? You didn't see that truck nearly hit you just then? Yeah, and... Uh, um, we had just turned, and I mean, we, I, didn't, I didn't even know the truck existed, you know. But um, God does that for us all the time. He protects us, you know, and I was just showing that. Now, here's another, just another thing about dads. See, um, so I'm going with the, uh, the feeling good thing about Father's Day. Cause there's, so, uh, so this next video thing here is, uh, uh, I think, is a great dad, okay? Now, he might not be a world-famous dad, but you can tell that he loves his daughter, Okay, go ahead. Here's this next one here. He's doing all the cheers with his daughter. So who wouldn't want a dad like that? You know, I mean, um, but you, it, it doesn't mean you have to do crazy stuff. But the thing is, you know, you see how, yeah, I mean, he's doing it because he loves his daughter, you know, and he's connected. I mean, when she, there's connection. I think that's, that's probably the main, um, main uh, emphasis, you know, um, is that fathers need to be connected. Um, and I have, I have a whole bunch. I've got like a, a whole thing of facts 
you know, that are, to me, facts are interesting. Now they're not necessarily interesting to everybody else, you know, and, and it gets long after a while, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to do all, the, say all these facts here, but um, let me see if I can find one here. Um, I'll just, I'll just start, I'll, I'll go ahead, put them up as I read them, Kat, and I'll, uh, um, and I'll, uh, uh, I'll shorten it here. I'll tell you by the number here. Okay, so, um, Okay, number one, fathers and infants can be equally as attached as mothers and infants. When both parents are involved with a child, infants are attached to both parents from the beginning of life. Number two here, father involvement is related to a positive child health outcomes in infancy. Number three, uh, father involvement using authoritative parenting, loving with the clear boundaries and and expectations, leads to better emotional, academic, social, and behavioral outcomes for children. And uh, let's go uh, to number four here. Children who feel a closeness with their fathers are twice as likely as those who do not enter college or to find stable employment after high school, 75% less likely to have teen birth, 80% less uh, likely to spend time in jail, and half as likely to experience multiple depression syndromes, symptoms. So anyways, there's, there's 10 of them. I mean, they're all, to me, they're fascinating. I could just read them and, you know, go on and on. But... Uh, um, and, and it's, all, it's all great because fathers are so important. But uh, 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 the results of uh, an absence in, of a father uh, is nothing short of disastrous. And I'm just going to read these real fast. Uh, and the reason, why I, uh, the reason why these were important to me is as I was reading them, I realized this is all the stuff that I suffered from, from not having a dad. You know, uh, may, maybe not, you know, chronically or whatever you call it, not... Yeah, it wasn't, uh, but let's go, just, I'll read them really quickly here. Emotional insecurity, behavioral problems, truancy and poor academics, delinquency and youth crime, promiscuity and teen pregnancy, drug and alcohol abuse, homelessness, exploitation and abuse, abuse and emotional maltreatment, physical health problems, mental health disorders, life chances, uh, future relationships and mortality. It said that that people who grow up with a father uh, live, since they take they they count all the, everything now, they live four years longer than people that that grow up without without a father. Yeah. So it's a, uh, but I like I said I so I I read all these things, and I said, gosh, I said, you know, yeah. When I met Ruth, see it says life chances there. Uh, yeah, when I when I met Ruth, um, of course I was uh, I was saved then, but what happened is the devil was talking to me, and, and he said, uh, uh, and and I thought, yeah, I said I want I want to marry her, yeah, she, she'd be a good catch, you know, and uh, um, but what the I heard this voice seriously, I, I heard a voice in my head said, she's too good for you, and I and I, I remember looking in the mirror and I and I said, yeah, she's too good for me. You know, and, 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 and then it was weird because the devil's stupid. And he said, besides, she's going to meet uh, somebody. She was going away on a trip. She, she used to be Hilton Sutton's secretary, and they were going, she had to go on a trip with, him, with them for a conference. And he said, she's going to meet, you know, a rich doctor when she's there. And I thought, where did that idea come from? And I, and I said, wait a minute. I said, I would have never thought of that. This is what I'm thinking in my head. I said, I said oh, Satan, you, you, uh, you showed your hand. I said, since, since you said I shouldn't go after her, I'm going after her. And she caught me. <laughs> Anyways, but so like I said, see, I didn't think I had a chance, you know, with marrying a, you know, a, a virtuous, young, beautiful girl. And um, see how wrong I was? Anyways, no, so uh, um, for, I'm going to run through this last part here. This is, uh, I found this to be the most fascinating thing, and I might not give, uh, do all of them because, like I said, I got pages of this stuff, and I'm just going from here. Okay, uh, attributes of Jesus' relationship with the Father. I, might, I would encourage you um, as, a, as a spouse or as, as a father uh, or as a child, you know, Read John chapter 5, starting 17 through 27, I think it is. Uh, no, no, 17, but it's 17 through 37. Yeah, it's like 20 verses. 
but it totally explains the relationship of God with Jesus as a father. You know, and if you ever want to want to know, uh, see some fascinating things. Uh, so, like I said, I'm just going to run through these so uh, we don't take too long. Okay, uh, number one, Jesus was a reflection of the Father, and so um, in everything, I think you can relate this yourself uh, to yourself and your children. Okay, that your child is a reflection of you. Okay. Uh, uh, seven, uh, verse 17, in his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at work, at his work, to do um, this very day, and I too am working. Jesus gave them, verse 19, Jesus gave them this answer, truly I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the father doing, because whatever the father does, the son does also. Ever wonder why my, my, uh, my boys are back there doing the cameras and... Uh, and why uh, they're up here playing in a band, you know, because they do what they see their dad doing. You know, and we didn't ask them to, you say, we need to have a family band. You know, what happened is when they were 10 years old, they came up to us and said, Mom and Dad, we want to play real instruments like you guys. And they, so they did. And you guys do a great job. Okay? So, um, uh, number two, Jesus was dependent on his father. So as a father, you're, Children are dependent on you. Uh, uh, verse 20, for the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these so that you will be amazed. And uh, uh, number three, Jesus had, has faith in his father, father's love for him. So Jesus, he, believe, he always believes his father loves him. How important is that? Uh, Number four, the father allows Jesus to see him working. So God brings his son to work with him. Not a bad idea. Okay, and uh, uh, number five, Jesus trusts and has confidence in his father. And that all came from one verse, uh, verse 21. For just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son gives life to those to whom, uh, to whom he is pleased to give it. Okay, uh, number six here. Oh, Jesus and his father work together in the same business, the business of giving life and bringing the dead to life. Uh, uh, verse 22, moreover, the father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to his son. Then the father gives great responsibility to Jesus. That's another thing. You know, that's a great thing about fathers is a good father gives responsibility to his kids. But he doesn't necessarily do it uh, and watches over him every second. You know, he, but he, he watches, but he doesn't tell him, no, you're doing it wrong. He lets his son do what he's called to do. Or his, his daughter, same thing. You know, your dad says, well, I'm expecting you to do this. And then he just, then he just watches. It's a... Uh, Responsibility is something that for when kids become, uh, become of age and uh, um, fathers know when to give it. A good father does. Okay, and also uh, number eight, there's no competition between Jesus and the father. Uh, verse 26, for as the father gives life to himself, so has he granted the son to uh, have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the son of man. Verse 30, by myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. So, uh, verse nine, or number nine, Jesus lives to do the Father's will. And number 10, Jesus' validation. I thought this is really interesting. Jesus' validation comes from his Father. See, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't worried what the world thought. He wasn't worried what, uh, you know... Uh, you know, what he could become on his own. You know, the disciples said, uh, well, they wanted, he knew they wanted to make him king. You know, that, to any, most people, that'd be a, a, a temptation. You know, uh, and so, so, but what happened is he said, well, you know, the Father's doing all this in me. You know, that's enough. You know, I'll, I'll be happy that, you know, doing the will of my Father. And, uh, um, and then the, uh, finally here, the, uh, what's very interesting is if you look at uh, um, God's, in God's relationship with Jesus, 
you'll see the same relationship that Jesus had with his disciples. He gave them responsibilities. You know, they knew that he loved them unconditionally. You know, all the things that, um, you could go through the whole list, uh, that, uh, 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 that the disciples were a reflection of Jesus. I mean, you, I could tell that to pastor. He could, give, he could quote you the scripture from where it said that they went around, um, you know, uh, doing the works that the Holy Ghost, make, giving signs, you know, whatever. You know, you know the scripture. Okay, I could name any of these. You know, saying uh, that uh, the disciples were dependent upon Jesus. Uh, the disciples had faith in Jesus' love for them. Uh, uh, Jesus allowed the disciples to see him work. I mean, every single one of these. You know, it's, and so that's what happens, you know, fathers. You know, not only uh, do you reflect your father, but hopefully, hopefully you shine a little bit, a little bit brighter because uh, uh, your heavenly father shines on you. So, uh, but then what happens is your kids shine like you do, but you hopefully even, even a little bit brighter you know, as, as God ministers them. So thank God we have a heavenly father that, uh, um, that trusts us, that he's, he's called us to, to do his work. You know, you say, well, you know, I'm, I work at a gas station. That's great. You know, you know the, our, our job with our father is to bring life and to bring light. And I, I, wanna, I wanna thank you, God, Lord, for the great honor it is to be a father. And uh, it's, your word says that children are an inheritance from you and blessed is a man whose quiver is full. Lord, and uh, after you and, uh, uh, and my relationship with my wife, my relationship with my children, the most important thing of, any, of all the things in my life. It's you and, my, and then my, my spouse and then my children. And I thank you for our God. And I thank you that you have given me guidance to, to be a father. And I thank, that you, thank you that you give guidance to, uh, to everyone that, that asks you for help, asks you for wisdom, asks you for guidance because that's the kind of God you are. You're a good, good father. And Lord, you, and I thank you for the greatest days to come for families, Lord God, in this country. I thank you, God, for uh, godly leaders, Lord, that represent fathers to their nations, Lord God. I thank you that, uh, that we have uh, a father in the White House. We have a father in the governor's mansion. We have fathers, not just natural fathers, but uh, also spiritual fathers that get the guidance from you and, and, and do what you've called them to do to lead our country, Lord God. And I thank you for restoring marriages, Lord God, restoring relationships, restoring, uh, yeah, for, even for, uh, like with my neighbor who didn't know his dad, for people in their, coming into their lives to, to be fathers for them, Lord God. Just as uh, uh, Pastor Rosie and Jim Scalise were a father to me uh, back then at Lakewood, Lord, I thank you that you send fathers to those who are orphans, Lord God. You know, and I ask you, and I thank you for it, for your glory, Lord, in the name of our blessed Lord Jesus Christ, amen.